living fear to fear. Laughter hides their silent cries. Only Jesus sees. The message for today is justification. Righteousness by faith, justification. We're going to go through what justification means. We're going to go through what it's saying to us, what God is saying to us. We will go through the story. We will go through the birth. And we will go through the message. What did I say we're going to go through? Wonderful. The story, the birth, and the message. Before we do so, please kneel with me as we pray. Lord, we want to thank you so much for allowing us to come into your presence, allowing us to come into your sanctuary, Lord. Father, so many times we can talk to you, we can pray to you, we can speak to you, but do we often remember who we are talking to? Lord, you are the God of the universe, the one who created us all in our mother's wombs. You are the one, Lord, who loves us, who gave himself for us. And therefore, Lord, I pray that as we come to look at the things in your word, you would give us strength to believe the words you have said. Lord, as we have said, ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. But does the word really change us, Lord? Please give us the strength to believe your words so that we can be saved in your heavenly kingdom. Once again, Lord, I pray that you would please forgive us of our sins Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That if there's anything between you and us, between you and other people, Lord, you would put it aside. You would cleanse us so we can hear all of your words that you are saying to us today in your beautiful love letter. Lord, I pray you would cleanse and clear our minds so that the Holy Spirit can speak to us, can convict us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. That we may be saved, Lord, eternally. So into your hands we commit this message, Lord, and as we open your letter, we pray that you would give us wisdom and understanding from your Holy Spirit to know what you are saying to us, so that we may be a church, Lord, cleansed from sin and filled with your Holy Spirit. These things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The story. In the year 2007, 2007, I was about 11 years old. And as I was 11 years old, I came to my parents and I said, Mom, Dad, I want to be baptized. Being 11 years old, they said, well, you know, what do you know about the word? Why do you want to get baptized? And I spoke with the pastor and I had some uh, children's Bible studies. So as I continued to have these studies, um, they said, well, we believe that you're ready now. You can, by the grace of God, be baptized. The reason why I got baptized is a lot like what we had last week in AY. We had a wonderful AY last week and I was really encouraged by it. And one of the questions was, why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? Why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? And when I thought about this for myself, I said, I am a Seventh-day Adventist because God frees me, cleanses me from sin. Now, to some, that sounds very cliche, right? Yes, you know, God cleanses us from sin. But for me, it was very, very specific. It is for this reason that even though I was young, as the Lord says, do not hinder the children from coming to me. I was not hindered, and therefore, by the grace of God, I came to the Lord and chose to give my life to God. Though I was the age of 12, there was something in my heart, something in my mind that just wasn't right. I didn't feel good. I felt guilt and shame. Though I was so young, we go through these things, even as children. Sometimes it's easy to forget as we get older. 
And though I went through these things, I said, I want to be free from sin. I want to be cleansed. And so from what I'd seen in the word of God, that means I needed to be baptized. The washing, the regeneration of God's presence, his Holy Spirit, cleansing us with his blood from sin. Amen? Amen. So by the grace of God, January 12th, 2008, I was baptized. I thought I would be seeing a big rain in that. On the 12th of January 2008, I was baptized, church. Amen. Amen. So I was telling everyone the decision that God had helped me to make in my room to the rest of the church, saying that I would be with him by the grace of God forever. I... After I was baptized, I continue to get older. And as we get older, 12, 13, 14, 15, we start going through different thoughts, emotions, feelings. But at this time, I thought to myself, something's clearly not working here. I'm reading the word of God. I'm doing what I should. But unfortunately, when I get upset, I'm still slamming doors at home. <laughs> when I get upset with my parents, I'll just be like, Mom, Dad, I'm really not happy right now. And I'd storm off and do my own thing. Something's not measuring up here because Christ didn't do things like that. He was Christ like. And if I am to follow Christ, then I need to be a Christian. I need to be Christ like. So I said, something's clearly not right here. Lord, please tell me what I need to do. I continue to read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And in there, I found something that was very, very vital. A beautiful word that we find in the hymn number 309. Does anyone remember what that hymn is? Hymn number 309. Can someone just look it up for me, please? 309, not 109. 309. I surrender all. You see, a lot of the time, it was a bit of me and a bit of God. It was a bit of this and a bit of that. But as Christ said, you cannot serve, we cannot serve God and man. So therefore, it ended up being my way, what I wanted. Until, by the grace of God, I got down on my knees and I said, Lord, if I'm going to make it to a heavenly kingdom, this just isn't going to work. I need your strength, I need your help to surrender everything. Now, you think that that's the hard part surrendering all. But it gets a little bit harder. It was then at that time that as I surrendered to the Lord, he said, okay, I've got you now. You've given everything to me. And yes, it was hard, but by the grace of God, his biddings are our enablers. Whatever God says, we can do it with his strength. Amen? Amen. So then I came to my mom, I came to my dad, and I said, Mom, Dad, you know, I've done these things, please forgive me. And they said, of course, you know, we forgive you. And I came to God, and he forgave me. I realized that God works how we see the cross. We need to be right with God, but we also need to be right with each other, together. And that's sometimes something we often leave out. Oh, I just need to ask forgiveness from God. I've hurt God. Yes. But in hurting God, we have often hurt other people. And that leaves some deep wounds and some deep scars. But God wants to heal us. Amen? Amen. So by the grace of God, I continued to ask forgiveness of those who I hurt and ask that they would forgive me too. But there came to a point when I was like, you know what, Lord? I think this is just a little bit too far. I can't do it anymore. Before that, I had joy. I had peace. I had love in my heart. See, the Lord is someone who has made us spiritual, physical, emotional, spiritual. We are whole beings, all together. Emotional and mental people. So if you don't feel something, you know how they say, I feel it in my chest. If you feel it in your chest, there's probably something wrong. And the Lord wants to take that out of our hearts. So the Lord said to me, you need to do this and you need to do that. And I said, Lord, that's, that's just a little bit too far. I don't think I can do that. And he was right. I couldn't do it. 
it. But God wanted to do it through me. If at that moment I had surrendered, brothers and sisters, I would have continued living and enjoying life peacefully, with love in my heart because of the Holy Spirit. However, I decided to go my own way. I still did things in church. I still encouraged people. I still did Sabbath school. But I became a serious Martha. Jesus said to Martha, Martha, you are troubled. You are worried about many things, but what is needful? One thing is needful. And who had that good part? Mary has chosen that good part. And it shall not be taken away from her. You see, Mary decided to sit at Jesus' feet. A woman who had been troubled with demons. A woman who had been taken in adultery many times. A woman who had sinned against God. Who had sinned against other people. But Jesus, Jesus when he saw Mary, and they wanted to kill her, throw stones at her, this woman has sinned. And Jesus said, you who has not sinned, cast the first stone. No one could pick up a stone because we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen. By the grace of God, Jesus, who had no sin, who has no sin, who became sin for us but was sinless, said to Mary, where are your accusers right now? And she said, nowhere, Lord. And he said, neither do I condemn you. Brothers and sisters, if Jesus, the Son of God, did not condemn Mary many sins that she had, and confessed and forsook them, what right do we have? What right do we have to hold past sins against our brothers and sisters when they have confessed, forsaken, and repented of their sins? We are not God because even God did not do that. He is merciful and we are to be merciful like him. As I continued to be a Martha, running around church, doing good things for everyone, I realized that there was something, something missing, something greatly missing. And as I sat down in my room, I think it was the year 2017, two years ago, I said, Lord, there's something missing here. I really need some help. And he took me to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, and it talks about the different churches. What church are we today of the seven churches? Laodicea. Laodicea was lukewarm. And so when I said to my friends, after I'd heard this from a speaker, there was a, a well-known speaker, and he came to this church, he came to our church, and it was encouraged that he speak to the young people. And as he spoke to the young people, he said, I have something to tell you. And he said, yes, you know, what is it? I was expecting, you know, be faithful unto God, be pure, be strong, keep the commandments. He said this, if you want to leave church, leave church. I said, you can't say that. That's to the young people. That's probably what they'll do. He said, God says, do not be lukewarm. Sister White tells us that to be in the church, but playing in the world is worse than being a heathen. Because we are claiming the name of Christ, claiming to be Christians and doing utter foolishness. So he said, it's better for you to go outside of church if you want to be outside of church, tell your parents and go. But if you want to be on fire for the Lord, be on fire for the Lord. Amen. I said, well, I have a lot to do then. I said, Lord, give me the strength. And so being in Revelation, the Lord showed me that I had the lay of the sea in spirit. Though I was doing so much for God, he wasn't really interested in that. He was interested in something else. I remember um, watching a documentary, watching um, a program. And in this program, there was a rich family. They had so many things. They had money. They had cars. They had things. They had stuff. And they just kept on giving their children, giving their children different things. 
but they had to go on business trips. They had to be away. They couldn't be present with their children. And so therefore, one day, the child said to his parents, he said, Mom, Dad, you know, thank you for all of these things, but it means nothing. He said, why? I've given you food, I've given you clothing, I've fed you, I've loved you. What more could you need? He said, you're never here. You are never with me. You don't spend time with me. The parents did not know that their children couldn't even swim because they didn't spend time with Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4 and verse 6. Malachi chapter 4 and verse 6. And it says, And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. This is the last verse of the book of the Old Testament. God is saying, I want to bring the fathers and the mothers, the children and the cousins, the families together. No more do I want them to be separate. I want them to be one. What the children need, what the parents needed, is to spend time as a family. And it's the same, it's no different between us and God. He says, I don't want your money. I have all the money in the world. I don't want your house, I don't want your car, I don't want the things that you have. Now please don't get me wrong, we still need to pay tithe, amen? amen. But the Lord is saying the material things that we think we have to keep giving God is not what he's interested in. He's interested in somebody called Why? Oh, you. He's interested in you. He's interested in you. You see, the Lord sees us. Though we have mess, though we have issues, though we have problems in our lives that other people see and condemn us for, other people see and say, you're not really worthy. Jesus sees everything, the good and the bad, and he says, I still want you. Because that's his selfless, unconditional love. It's not about what you've done or didn't do. It's about you. So the Lord, by his grace, helped me to stop running. And to be very honest with you, it happened many times but the Lord has helped me the most in literally this past week. The Lord has helped me in previous years and now to ask forgiveness to those I'm, I have hurt. To get right with my brothers and sisters because we always say if I died today, where would I be? Yes, we'd all be in the grave. But on which side of the judgment would we be standing on? Could the Lord say to us, come. Come and sit with me in my throne as I have sat in my father's throne. Or would he say to us, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. Because if we remember from Matthew chapter 25, it says, the, ten young, the five young virgins. They said, but Lord, we've given to the poor. We've fed the hungry. We've been to the prisons. And the Lord says, he doesn't say, Yes, you know, you don't. from our sins, not in, so we can be saved. Amen? So, Jesus the Savior wants to save us from our sins, and if someone could please read the other verse, uh, Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Brother Tubuda. So, sin equals death, automatically. And being in this world, being sons of daughter, sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, we are, as we call, born in sin and shaped in iniquity. We have to choose to come out of that. So we either live our lives and try to be good people and die, or we can ask the Lord for help and strength to cleanse us from all our sins. We cannot do it by ourselves. Some have been told, you can't do it. 
So forget it. It's okay. The Lord will accept you anyway. No. Jesus, God does not change. His law is the same. And Jesus, the Son of God, gave his life for you and for me. He died showing that great love in our place. The story once goes, and I like my sister telling this children's story, of a young man, a young Chinese man who was a servant. And he served his master faithfully. He looked after him, and he helped him, and he nurtured him. But one day he came to his master and he said, Master, there is nothing that I can say but thank you. And he said, what, what do you mean? He said, I, I need to go. He said, why do you need to go? What, what's happened? Have I not looked after you? Have I not fed you? Have I not cared for you enough? He said, yes, Master, there's nothing that you have done. You've looked after me well. However, my brother, it is him. He said, what is it with your brother? I can give him the money he needs. I can help him. Do not worry, it's fine. He said, no. Um, in my country, if someone commits an offense against the law, then a family member of his can go and die in his place. Therefore, helping him. He said, I don't have family, I don't have children, but my brother, he has committed an offense. And my brother, he has a family, he has a wife, and he has children, and therefore, I go to die in his place. That is Jesus. He is our elder brother. He came from heaven. He left all the glory that is there, the worship and the honor, to be spat upon, to be beaten, to be mistreated of people who thought he was just a man. Not realizing that he was the God of the universe, the God that created them. But he did it for the joy set before him. He did it because he saw you, he saw me down in the annals of history and said, I'm going to do it for you. Amen. Reconciliation. God is calling us to himself through the cross of Christ. The love that he displayed for you and for me draws us to his side because it is such great love that we can barely understand it. Confess, forsake, repent, conversion. Now, brothers and sisters, this is the part where we often stop. Turn with me in your Bibles to uh, Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 13. If someone could please get Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 13, and someone else get Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. Proverbs 28 and verse 13, Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. He that suffers his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesses and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Amen. Thank you, Sister Isolde. He who covereth his sins shall not prosper, but when we confess and we forsake. See, this is the problem. We often confess, but we don't really forsake. Because we do not have the power of ourselves to forsake. I remember one time. Um, the Lord was speaking to me, and I was sitting there, and I was like, I really want to do this. This is my thing. I want to sin. That's just what I want to do. I was being honest. But I said to the Lord, Lord, I need your help. Because if you don't help me, this is going to be trouble. When I, I tell you that I told this to the Lord, and straight away, the feeling that I wanted to sin was gone. Amen. I did not want to sin against God anymore. See, this is the problem. Paul tells us you have not resisted unto blood. We don't resist. We say, oh, I want to do that, so I'm going to do it. I want to eat this food, so I'm going to eat it. I'm going to go to bed at this time because I want to go to bed at that time. Instead of surrendering to the Lord and saying, Lord, I can't, but I know you can. Please help me. Confess, forsake, repent. If someone could please read Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, 
when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Thank you, Sister Michelle. I remember looking at this verse and thinking, okay, but what does it really mean to repent? It means to change your mind. We are told in Philippians 2 verse 5, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. A change of mind, thought, or belief. The devil wants our minds. He knows if he has our minds, he has our bodies. Because our minds control our bodies. Control what we do. What we eat, what we think, what we say. Therefore they say, change your mind, your thoughts. Even people who are just interested in having a healthy mind. They'll say, think good thoughts. Say good things to yourself. Say good things to others. And it will change your course. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. But what does it mean to be converted? And this is what it means. To turn around a U-turn, if you were driving. To turn around to the worship of the true God. Turn around. See, we often talk about the big or serious things like um, drugs, um, we talk about drugs, alcohol, pornography, all these bad, big things, but then we don't talk about the smaller things, like the jealousy, and the backbiting, and the blackmailing, because they are heart sins. Nobody doesn't really see those, unless it gets really bad. In Matthew chapter 23 and verse 23, Jesus mentions how the Pharisees, he said, you hypocrites, you tithe your food, your mint, your cumin, your roof, as we can see there on the screen. You tithe these things, the big things you do, but the less you leave. As it says, the weightier matters of the Lord, judgment and mercy and faith. Faith, brothers and sisters, these ought you have to have done and not let the others under. We are the same today. We say, oh, you must take off your jewelry. Yeah, it's true. Oh, you, you can't eat these different meats. It's better to be healthy. It's better to be in the Lord. Yes, it's true. Don't go to church on Sunday because, you know, that's not God's day. That's what the Catholic Church deems as their mark on Christianity. But God says from the Bible we need to worship on Saturday. Yes, that's also true. But we forget the heart matters. We forget that if we allow God to change us from our hearts, the rest would be easy. Amen. We would, because of our love for God, change. Brothers and sisters, when I said that the Lord had started me on this journey, I remember it was so sweet. 2011, I studied the word, I read the word, and I developed a great love for God that I would do anything for him. Anything. So when the Lord told me about dress reform and how it's better to dress more ladylike and more becoming of a woman than to wear things that they say pertain to a man. So I did that by God's grace and I did it emptying half my wardrobe of my clothes. Now to some people, like, I can't do that. I can't, you know, stop wearing this or I can't start wearing that. But because I loved the Lord, I wanted to let go of those things. And what we try and do is let go of the things then love the Lord. When the Lord says, love me with all your heart, with all your soul, your mind, and your strength. And afterwards, it will be so easy to let go of those things. Amen. Amen. If we read Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26 and 27. Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25 to 27. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall, might? Shall. You shall be clean from all of your filthiness. From all of your idols will I cleanse you. And this is the new covenant, the promise that God makes to you and to me. Of ourselves, we cannot do it, but through Christ, all things are possible. Yeah. 
A new heart also will I give you. Is that you or God? God. A new spirit will I put within you. Is that you or God? It's God. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you. That's not you trying. That's not you striving every day to be good like I did. Trying to be a perfectionist. And ye shall keep my judgments and do them. You see, we have been taught the law of legalism. Obey, it will be okay. Brothers and sisters, we do need to obey, but because of love. Amen. Christ relates it to a marriage relationship. A husband loves the wife and therefore wants to do things for her. A wife loves her husband and therefore wants to do things for him. Would you die for a stranger? Anyone, would you die for a stranger? If you don't know them, know nothing about them, would you die for them? No, I'm not seeing any hands go up. Would you die for your mum? Yes. Straight away, everyone says yes. Why? For those of you who said yes, why would you die for your mum? Because you love her. That is simply it, brothers and sisters. We are trying to submit ourselves to Christ, who right now seems to be a stranger. We don't know him. Therefore, we're not interested in doing the things he wants us to. But when we read the word, when we love him, when we get to know God as our savior and our friend, everything will be easier. Amen. Everything will fall into place. And this is why Christ says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. We make it so hard, brothers and sisters, we do not study to realize that the Lord wants our hearts. Amen. He wants us. Amen. And then sanctification. Sanctification means to make <coughs> us holy. I do understand that time is running out, but if you could please give me a few more month, a minutes, I would love to share a few more things with you. If someone could please to turn to John chapter 17 and verse 17. And somebody else, Exodus chapter 31 and verse 13. Exodus chapter 31 and verse 13. John chapter 17 and verse 17. And then Exodus 31 and verse 13. Verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. Amen. Thank you, Brother Tupida. Through the truth. The word is true. God first, through justification, says, I've made you righteous. Therefore, you are righteous. He takes away our sins. And with the absence of sin, we are then righteous by the grace and the strength of Lord. It is righteousness by faith. You don't see the process going on. You don't necessarily feel it, but God does it. Amen. That is righteousness by faith. Justification, it says, the righteousness by which we are justified is imputed. What did I say? Imputed. The righteousness by which we are sanctified is imparted. The first is our title to heaven, and the second is our fitness for heaven. This is why, brothers and sisters, we need to believe and obey believe that God has forgiven us of our sins. When he says he has forgiven us, he has forgiven us. Believe on the name and the word of the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. The first is our title to heaven. God says, okay, I've forgiven you. You are righteous. Now, sanctification, the fitness for heaven. He says, I call you my child, as most parents say to their children. Now you need to act. But oftentimes we try to act like it ourselves, but God says, I will give you the power to act like it. Child of the Son of God. And lastly, glorification. Romans chapter 8 and verse 17. And if someone could please read that, Romans chapter 8 and verse 17, and someone else could please read 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 52. 
So that's Romans chapter 8 and verse 17 and verse Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52. And if children, then as it is of God, and join as with Christ, if so be that we suffer with you, that we may also we may be also glorified together. Amen. Amen. Thank you, my sister, Sister Angela. And also first Corinthians 15, chapter verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Amen. Amen. Oftentimes we are told that sanctification is the work of a lifetime. You'll be forever trying to not sin and um, worship God. That's not the truth. Sanctification is the work of the lifetime in abiding in Christ. Christ says, if you are of God, you will not sin. Therefore, if we do not sin, we need to abide in the vine. Abide in Christ and we will not sin. Because like we mentioned earlier, when you love someone, you don't want to hurt them. You don't want to do anything against them. I know we just missed Exodus chapter 31 and verse 13, and that is very important. Exodus chapter 31 and verse 15. Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily, my Sabbaths ye shall keep. What shall ye keep? Sabbath. That's what we're here today. My Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that ye may know that who? I am the Lord, the Lord that does and sanctifies you, that makes you holy. Our fitness. And finally, as we have read glorification, the Lord wants to take us, as my um, auntie read, to take our bodies and change the outside because God has already changed the inside. Yeah. The inside is here. The outside is afterwards. And so, in closing, this, brothers and sisters, is the message. This is the message. We talked about my story, the story, we talked about the birth, and this is the message, the conclusion. If you turn with me to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 1. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 1 to 7 is what we're going to read. Galatians chapter 3 verses 1 to 7. Oh foolish Galatians, who have bewitched you, who that ye should not obey the truth? before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth, crucified among you. If we can read together the second verse and uh, read alternately again. This is only the right man of you, receiving the spirit of the grace of the Lord, or by hearing of faith. Are ye so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you in the spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he by the works of the Lord, by the hearing of faith? Even it is not grand believe God, and it was accomplished in righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Abraham believed the words of God. And it was accounted to him for what? For righteousness, for being right with God. Righteousness is in right standing with God. Nothing between my soul and my savior, nor of this world delusive dreams. I have renounced all sinful pleasure. Jesus is mine and there is nothing between. And so, brothers and sisters, as we read earlier from Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, it said that he wants to bring our hearts, the hearts of the children, the young people, to the parents, and to bring them together. The Lord wants to unite us as a church, family, as brothers and sisters. He doesn't want there to be backfighting. He doesn't want there to be hurt. He doesn't want there to be sadness in our hearts. He wants to have us healed from the wounds and scars that we have made on each other and ourselves. 
when Jesus was here on this earth, I'm going to read uh, just from Luke chapter 4 and verse 39, because time is fleeting. Luke chapter 4 and verse 39. Speaking about Peter's mother who was sick, it says, And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And how much? Immediately. Immediately she arose and ministered unto them. Brothers and sisters, I have many scriptures here that we could have spoken about this same. Luke chapter 5 and verse 13. And he put forth his hand and touched him, and said, saying, I will be thou clean. And how much? Immediately. Immediately. The leprosy departed from him. The point of it is, brothers and sisters, is that when God says he has forgiven you, he has forgiven you. When God says to us, be thou clean, it is straight away. We read earlier Job chapter 9 and verse 20. And that is going to be our final scripture. Job chapter 9, verse 20, 21, and Job 1, 1. Job chapter 9 and verse 20. I've had this question for a long time. Lord, you said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, be thou perfect even as thy Father in heaven is perfect. <coughs> How? How can we be perfect? Job chapter 9, verse 20 and verse 21. It says, if I justify myself, say that I am righteous myself, my own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, it shall prove me perverse. Though I were perfect, this is Job speaking, in his trials and temptations, when he said, though he slay me to God, yet will I trust him, Job says, yet would I not know my own soul. I would despise my life. But if we look at Job chapter 1 and verse 1, our final scripture, Job chapter 1 and verse 1, if someone could please read that for us. Job chapter 1 and verse 1. There was a man in the land of Ur, whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Amen. Thank you, Martin. He did what? He feared God and then eschewed evil. Because of his love and devotion for God, evil was not a problem. Brothers and sisters, the hymn that I love so mostly is hymn number 412. Reconciled by his death for my sin. Justified by his life pure and clean, sanctified by obeying his word, glorified when returneth my Lord. Cover with his life, whiter than snow. Fullness of his life, then shall I know my life of scarlet, my sin and woe. Covered with his life, whiter than snow. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this message is hard. It's hard for us to let go of our past, to let go of our sins, to let go of self. But if, by God's grace, you would like to say, I surrender all. I know it will be hard, I know the journey is tough, I know I need to make and go and speak to some people and say, please forgive me. But is there anything, anything, brothers and sisters, that is worth missing heaven for? So if it is your desire to say, Lord, I want to commit myself to you again. Lord, I want you to make me righteous. I want you to take away my dirty, filthy clothing, all my righteousness that is as filthy rags, and you make me righteous. If that is your desire today, if that is what you want to say, can you please come and stand with me here at the front so we can pray and ask the Lord for his strength that he would make us holy. Brothers and 
just as time is running out, the Lord is calling us, He has been calling us, He is calling us. And we don't know what's going to happen to us. We could die today. We could die tomorrow. People always say that. But it could happen. We don't know. I remember I was very secure. I was very happy in my job. And I thought that the next school term, I'd be going back to school and I'd be helping out with my my one-to-one and I'd be teaching. But I received that phone call. We don't need you anymore. We have somebody else. We do not know our tomorrow. We do not know what can happen and therefore make it right with God today. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Let us kneel and pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you on bended knee. Because you have said, Lord, that it is our privilege to kneel before the God of the universe whenever possible to show the humility of our hearts. Lord, nothing in our hands we bring but simply to your cross we cling. We realize, Lord, our weakness and our inadequacy. We realize, Lord, that there's nothing in us that is good enough. But we realize, Lord, that Jesus, your son, is perfect. And he is good enough. And so we want to say, Lord, we surrender to your power. We surrender to you. We are tired of fighting. We are tired of running. We are tired of wondering who is chasing us. When, as your word says, no one is chasing us. Lord, I thank you that you have convicted us of sin of righteousness and of judgment. But now I pray, Lord, that as we go forward from this place, we would not forget the things that we have heard. But Lord, though the devil would want to steal these words from our hearts, Lord, we pray that you would seal them into our minds, that today would be the day of salvation. You have said you want to turn the hearts of the fathers and the mothers to the children and the children to their parents. Please, Lord, in our homes, in restitution, In our lives, Lord, help us to go to those people whom we have offended and ask for their forgiveness. And Lord, if there are those whom have hurt us, whom Lord have hurt us, and we know that, please give us the courage to go to them and say that we forgive them. Ask them for their forgiveness, for holding grudges against them. Lord, you have called us today because you want to save us. You want to save me, Lord. And so therefore, I pray that though we have made the physical decision to come to you now, give us the strength to keep making the daily decision to surrender to you. The Lord, when we come to that battle of of 10 o'clock at night and we want to eat something, give us the strength to say, I will wait until the morning. Give us the strength, Lord, when we want to wear certain things that do not glorify you, give us the strength, Lord, to choose not to do that. Lord, we want to to talk to people late at night and engage in things that are not righteous. Give us the strength not to do that. I pray, Lord, you please help us as you tell us to, to love righteousness and to hate sin. Put your love in our hearts, Lord. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Justify us, please, and call us righteous because we have come to you asking for your forgiveness as a church, as individuals, as families. Heal us, Lord, from our wounds of sin and selfishness so that we can be in your heavenly kingdom. So we can no longer be called Seventh-day Adventists, Lord, and be lying. We can no longer be called Christians and lying, but, Lord, we can give a true witness. As you have promised, Lord, you said that at the end of the world, There would be your people testifying, Lord, about you. Please, Lord, I pray, let us be the true witness that you want us to be, with Christ in us, the Holy Spirit in us, the hope of all glory. And Lord, please do not let us be like Ananias and Sapphira, who when they received your Holy Spirit, sinned and lied 
and was struck dead. Lord, this is serious. Please help us so we be saved in your kingdom. These things I pray will be praised and thanks in the name of Jesus Christ.